Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the manager of programs and events at WCET. And today we're talking with Paul Stacy, and he's with Creative Commons. Paul has vast experience with open ed resources. He's the associate director of global learning at Creative Commons, and he has led large scale open educational resource initiatives across British Columbia. Thank you for joining us, Paul. Okay. Yes, British Columbia and the United States now. So that is global. <laughs> That's right. Yes, and I did some work in um, in the Middle East and North Africa last year. So it's been really fascinating, Megan, to kind of see how OER and the whole efforts to share resources is spreading around the world. Great. Well, we look forward to hearing more about adoption and. Uh, how nationally and globally people are beginning to really embrace these resources as well as how that's opening doors and windows for people. So sure. what, does it, what does it mean if something is Creative Commons licensed? <laughs> sure, so um, I, I guess the basic uh, aspect of licensing something with Creative Commons means that you're willing to share it with others. And of course this is um, this kind of reverses the default, which is that everything that we author and create is immediately all rights reserved to us and held under copyright and not something that uh, can be readily shared. And with the evolution of the internet and the ability to use digital resources, it's of course so easy to copy and share and distribute those resources. And, and really Creative Commons is an enabler of sharing. Terrific, and when you mention resources on the internet, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's quality resources. What are some examples of Creative Commons licensed works across the internet that are of high quality? <laughs> yeah, I think. Well, I think so. First of all, um, I think it's important to know that there's there's over a billion works now that have been Creative Commons licensed around the world, and those works range you know, from from little photographs to songs to books to animations. Now, some of them pertain to education and some of them are outside of education. And so the, first of all, there's a really high volume. And then I think the question about quality is a really interesting one, Megan, because I'm sure you're kind of thinking about that in the context of education, you know, what constitutes for a high quality Creative Commons licensed resource and, and I think this is a really important question because it does open up the question about quality. It's not just about volume, it's about finding really good stuff. And, and yet, I think that we don't always know what we mean by quality, um, especially in education. You know, I can think of all kinds of courses and faculty and teachers that I've had that perhaps if you looked at their teaching resources, you know, those resources may not have been, you know, highly polished and, uh, you know, beautiful color, um, but they were really incredibly effective teachers. So I think when we think about quality in the education context, we have to think about both the resources, but also the full teaching experience. Um, so to, to maybe point to a few uh, resources that I would think of as high quality that are specific to education, um, I would say that the NOVA um, project, which is for psychology, has produced some awesome, very high quality Creative Commons licensed resources for the whole discipline of psychology. And one of the reasons I think it's high quality is because they've engaged a large number of different professors who all have varying expertise in the field of psychology to highlight their expertise. So it's become a collective work rather than the singular work of a single f faculty member. And, uh, and they've also uh, developed it as a web-based resource that includes a lot of rich media. So images, not just text, but images and um, uh, video and so on that enhances the actual sort of production values of the resource. Um, and then there's lots of others. I mean, I could go on and on. There's stuff for simulation. I think that the FET simulation materials are, are really quite good in terms of high quality and have been uh, rigorously developed. I do think that OpenStax from an open textbook perspective is producing high quality materials. 
um, that again have been peer reviewed and developed to kind of the levels that we might normally expect with a you know a traditional professional publisher to have used in terms of producing materials. Um, but again, I think that the question of quality needs to be balanced against the question of whether the learning and teaching that results from the use of those materials is effective. So the extent to which the materials are actually impactful from a learning perspective is really the key question from my point of view. That's a great point because often we, we question what quality is, but we don't really have any standards to which to compare that because it really is the teaching and the outcomes that come with that. So that's a very good point. Yeah, and I guess in the context of online learning, of course, you know, there's increasingly a set of tools and rubrics that can be used to assess the quality of the online learning. And, and so things like quality matters, you know, the effectiveness of that rubric, I think, applies equally well to OER as it does to sort of traditional closed education materials. Right, right, great. And as an OER evangelist, I'm sure that sometimes you meet resistance trying to encourage people to share their work, and is that the case? Are people often reticent about sharing their work? And how do we articulate the broader benefit to the community? Yeah, I think it is so certainly there's been a long history of, uh, of resistance to sharing education materials. I think that it's in the education context, I think of it like this, Megan. Um, I think of it as increasingly like research. So if we speak to our faculty colleagues about research and them being researchers, they would tell you that they're very interested in seeing their research be disseminated, seeing their research be cited, seeing their research be used as the foundation on which other research is done to enhance the discipline and the knowledge and understanding of the particular field that they're researching. That kind of practice has not always been the case when it comes to the actual teaching and learning materials that are being used in the classroom. Normally, the frequently practiced method is that a faculty member just develops their own teaching and learning materials, uses them within the context of that classroom, and no one else gets to see them other than the students who pay tuition and enroll in that course. But I think what's happening is that the practices associated with academic research are migrating to teaching and learning materials. And that means that part of what's happening is that the teaching and learning materials are becoming visible and accessible and subject to peer review, let me suggest. And also it means that we can start with, rather than each faculty member kind of um, independently reinventing the wheel associated with the teaching and learning materials for their discipline, we can start with a shared set of materials on which everyone has the rights to customize, to localize, to, to edit and remix them to fit their particular way of teaching and the way that they understand their discipline. And it becomes um, you know, progressively better with everyone with having the ability to improve and enhance those materials and share them back so that everyone can benefit from it. So, so I think that um, the resistance to sharing is starting to diminish as people become more aware of that practice mm -hmm. and its similarities to what's been the traditional practice in research. Well, and over a billion resources really speaks to that. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, and I think another, another thing I'll just say, Megan, is that I think that there's been this notion that if you share, someone will use those resources in a way that is, to, is detrimental to you. Um, but I think that the, you know, as we now in, have been doing OER and sharing of resources for quite a long time, well, well for over 10 years, let's say, um, you know, we're finding that the, that there is, um, that people do not always act out of self-interest, that there's a lot of uh, willingness among most people to share and to have their work benefit the students and their peers and that they see that the whole their role as educators is is inherent in that role is sharing. And so, if you can embrace that and kind of not um, not succumb to the fear, I think that can be really healthy. All right, and that leads to one of my next questions, which is really, what is the benefit to a faculty member 
of licensing and sharing their resources. Sure. Well, I think in, in academia, most faculty members are interested in reputation. Um, that is a significant driver for most of them. And uh, certainly when they are reviewed in terms of performance on the research side, you know, they'd be reviewed based on how many, you know, how much research work have they produced and how much has it been used by their peers. I think again we can kind of begin to extrapolate those measures of performance that happen in research over to the education content side as well. And so you could imagine a faculty member uh, making the case for their performance being partly based on the extent to which they've produced some fantastic shared resources that their peers have used and that have significantly enhanced and developed the field overall. And so I think that um, what faculty can expect back from, uh, from developing and creating shared OER are a number of things. They can, uh, they can expect um, students typically to have a lower cost experience in terms of enrolling in their course and they can also by using OER ensure that students have access to all of the course materials including let's say an open textbook right from the start of the course without actually having to uh, tap into financial aid let's say to, to purchase a book mm -hmm. and having access to the materials right from the very beginning you know the research is starting to show that that actually leads to better learning outcomes and higher completion rates. And so there, there's kind of a, a faculty member can look at the teaching and learning benefits of, of OER and then I think can look at the reputational benefits of OER and see that there's some significant uh, wins for them in, in going in that direction. Right. There's a couple of examples. <laughs> Those are great examples and that was going to lead into my next question as well is how are students being affected by open textbooks or is it, I know it's a lot of times driven by cost We've talked about the quality a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Is it that they're more accessible? What are what are some of those real significant student outcomes? Yeah, so I, I I'm actually really excited about the student part of this. Um, I work with faculty a lot on the OER side, but I think that the next frontier of OER is around uh, student engagement. Um, I think that there's a variety of ways in which students. Um, can benefit from OER. I mean, the one that you mentioned regarding open textbooks. I mean, clearly, what we're what's happening uh, with the development of open textbooks is that, especially for high enrollment courses at the kind of um, you know the introductory levels of undergraduate study, you have the equivalent of a high quality publisher book being developed as an open textbook and made available to students at zero cost in digital form or if they want a print version at the cost of what it costs to print it. And so you have a much lower cost per student and that's been one of the drivers I would say associated with student interest because of the tremendous burden that debt can play in terms of financial aid on them getting their career started, which, which I think is an important consideration. I mean, if you look at the levels of student debt in North America, it's actually incredible how much debt students are creating. And as the father of a daughter who just graduated with some student debt, I can appreciate how um, that creates a disadvantaged position for you to get going with your career. You're already in the hole. Right. And I think that uh, it also prevents participation in a lot of courses, the cost of education. But I think that there's, while that's a compelling argument, and a lot of governments really like this, cost to students is a really compelling reason to consider using things like open textbooks. I think that the more compelling and deeper reasons are around improved learning outcomes and the extent to which we can show that OER creates as good as or a better learning experience than traditional materials is an important reason for all of us to think about. And there's starting to be research that indicates that. Um, and then where I think the true excitement will come, Megan, is when we engage students in not just consuming the OER as, you know, sort of the way they would consume normal education materials, but actually leveraging the fact that it's open and can be revised and improved and enhanced not just by faculty 
but by students. And the fact that we can look at students and engage them in learning activities that enhance the teaching and learning materials that then are shared back collectively and can benefit all subsequent students is a really high motivator for student engagement and I think is a fantastic new field emerging around what we're calling open pedagogy. Right, I look forward to more seeing more collaboration that's two-way where the students mm -hmm. get in there and manipulate the work and incorporate their own takeaways. I think that's very, very exciting. And I think that it yeah. enhances the learning. Yeah, and there are examples of that already. So it's not like it's totally uncharted. Um, and certainly um, there's some great examples of courses that have required students, let's say, to, um, to contribute material to it, like ChemWiki, for example, at UC Davis, you know, it's like students improving the textbook associated with chemistry by adding content to it themselves for marks as an assignment. You know, that's a really good example of engaging students in, in participating and leveraging the open nature of the resources. And, and DS-106, another great example of like students writing assignments that other students then have to take and those becoming part of an assignment bank where the assignments weren't written by a faculty member but were actually written by students and subsequently carry forward from one semester to another. Great. I, I'm very excited about that new frontier. <laughs> Anytime yeah. you can get in there and actually be in the content uh, rather than just yeah. taking the test, I think really right. speaks to the outcomes and, and learning retention.